from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Suzanne Higgins and this is The Legislature Today. We launch our nightly coverage of the 2020 legislative session with reaction to Governor Jim Justice's State of the State Address. We'll be joined by the minority leaders of both the House and Senate in just a moment, but first, senior reporter Dave Mistich has highlights from last night's speech. Justice used some familiar narrative devices at the beginning of his speech. When I walked in the door, I said I was going to take you on a rocket ship ride, like that. And we've been on this rocket ship ride. But this time around, Justice appeared to temper his outlook for the upcoming fiscal year's budget. He held a sign that showed an up and down projection so that ultimately day, pointed now, upward. What I want you to do is change. And I want you to become on this lightning bolt ride with us because that's where we will go. We're underfilling and we are building in what should be built in. That's why tonight you're going to see that the budget that I propose to you is very, very conservative. According to state budget officials, the governor's $4.585 billion general revenue budget for fiscal year 2021 will be roughly $108 million less than the current allocation. In hopes of invigorating business possibilities in the state, Justice touted an idea for a Mountaineer Impact Fund, a proposal to establish a venture capital investment fund that's been floated by House Speaker Roger Hanshaw in the lead-up to the 2020 legislative session. You have a fund that becomes the bank that you can loan money and inspire people to, to, to invest within the state of West Virginia, and you can give all kinds a great return on their money that they invest, and you can bring money to our state like you can't imagine. It is an ingenious idea, and I absolutely will fully support it. Justice revisited his affinity for using props by having attendees in the House chamber put on highway worker safety vests. He also celebrated road work his administration has accomplished over recent years and said he looks forward to continuing that trend. 280 pieces of new equipment we have now, 27,000 miles of maintenance that they've done. 18 in 18 months, 500 projects and 1,100 miles done. We just went through the second round of bonding and we have, we have, believe it or not, another $146.5 million that we can just do anything we want with. And we're going to pour more and more and more money into our roads. Justice rolled out a set of new policy proposals, including requesting $1.9 million for Department of Military Affairs and Public Safety and Secretary ask, Jeff Sandy to establish a new task force to crack down on drug trafficking. Way. I will promise you, promise you, that if you are kind enough to give us that opportunity, and I want to say this as sincerely and as forcefully as a human being could ever say it, I want to look right in the camera and tell anybody, anybody that is trying to come into our state with drugs, we are going to bust your ass. That's all there is to it. The governor highlighted needs within the embattled Department of Health and Human Resources. To that end, he proposed hiring 87 additional workers for Child Protective Services at a cost of $26.4 million. Justice is also seeking $19.7 million to eliminate the wait list for services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's 1,060 of them that have been on a wait list for a long time, some of them four years. 600 of them are children. We have now found enough money. Tonight, I'm so proud to announce that Secretary Crouch and Secretary Hardy have found a solution 
and my budget will contain the funding to eliminate the wait list. Returning to finances, Justice also proposed a million dollars to increase opportunities at food banks across the state and another $2 million for a backpack program to feed needy school children. In closing, Justice returned to another set of familiar themes, including his love for the state and the role of governor as coach. I love you. I love this great state. I love all that we stand for. I love the fact that I've been able to be maybe a coach. I've been maybe working towards the fact that if we could just say that maybe, just maybe, I've been a coach that's been working to train you for the Olympics. And that's you being West Virginia. And all I would say now is go win the gold. For the legislature today, I'm Dave Mistich at the Capitol. Join us now are Senate Minority Leader Roman Prezioso and House Minority Leader Tim Miley. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Thanks for having me here, Suzanne. You have not minced words today. You have called the state of the state a very rosy campaign speech, uh, complete with props and, and special guests and a surprise funding for the Veterans Memorial out back. Um, Senator Prezioso, we'll begin with you, your reaction. Well, I'm glad he got off the rocket ship because I was afraid it was running out of fuel. And as we look at this budget, all the things that he's proposed, we have yet to disaggregate all the data and, and put, you know, you've got to look at the future. We've got six months left on this fiscal year. Uh, our severance tax is not looking that great. So I don't know if he'll get everything he wanted. The proposals that they did propose, like the IDD waiver, you know, of course, we supported that for years. And, and That's the intellectual yeah. and, and developmentally the disabled, disabled yeah. waiver, yes. Yeah, and, and the business and inventory tax, we've looked at those issues for years. You know, it's just a matter of how you fund it. And now, you know, he, he, he made a great campaign speech, uh, not a lot of substance, but it's up incumbent upon us now to look at the budget and see, you know, exactly how much money we're going to have and, you know, what programs we could fund. Uh, Delegate Miley, there were members of your caucus that have said, um, that have called it dangerous, what they say, the, the, the lack of the governor's candor last night. Well, I'm not sure if it was dangerous. It may be disingenuous to some degree. But, but let's be clear. The purpose of a state of the state address by any governor is to give yourself credit for what you've done in the past, whether it's true or not, and to present a bright, rosy picture for the future and hopefully an inspiring vision for the future. Many members of my caucus didn't feel like the ro rosy picture he was painting was the actual picture that exists here in West Virginia. And he didn't provide much inspirational hope for the future other than talking very generally about some things that may or may not happen. And you were, you were listening in the same way I was, possibilities of road funding from the federal government, possibilities of the hyperloop, all are just pie in the sky dreams it sounds like with no real plan to move West Virginia forward. And let's be clear, the state is not in as good as, and strongest position as he wants us to believe it is. You have both said the biggest challenge, and it was not mentioned last night, is the out-migration, is the, you know, our population is, is hemorrhaging, is what it's uh, been called, almost 60,000 in just the last five years. You know, and, and Delegate Spinago, I heard him in an interview last night, said that's about the size of Mountaineer Stadium. You know, just look at all the people they get in there, 60,000 people have migrated out of the state. And those are the people that have the means to go out. So, you know, we're losing a lot of intellectual, folks that could, could contribute to our society and things like that. And we're, we're not, we, we're, there's not a vision. Uh, he paints a rosy picture. He's, he's given tax credits to the coal companies and we know that the coal is diminishing. And, and you know, the, the 38,000 small businesses in this state that make this state go forward, you know, we're overlooking them. We can, we can give them some tax credits. You know, we can help them along, give them low interest or no interest loans to, 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 to be successful. And we, we haven't done that. We have, we've neglected our West Virginians. 
Uh, it, Delegate Miley, the, the property taxes on business equipment and, and inventory uh, for big manufacturers, that has uh, been proposed by the majority party. Um, you, you've pointed out that that's different than what was, uh, than what was proposed last year and didn't get through. Well, it does differ slightly, um, but the, what I want to point out about that is it's focusing solely on benefiting large facilities, large manufacturing type facilities, which are typically owned by large out-of-state corporations. The tax that they, that's on the books on the Constitution also taxes inventory. If you really want to help West Virginians and put them first, which is what the theme of our platform is, deal with the inventory tax because that affects both small businesses and large businesses that have inventory that have to pay that every year. That's how you help West Virginians but by helping large out-of-state corporations be relieved of their tax obligations of, on their equipment for large facilities, that, just, that doesn't benefit the average West Virginia small business owner. That benefits out-of-state corporations. And, it's and we've tried to do that in the past. We've had tax break after tax break after tax break for business interests, all of which we believe would spur economic development here. That hasn't happened. It won't happen if we get rid of this tax. To be clear, though, if we get rid of this tax, we have to come up with a way to replace that money because the money that that tax uh, brings in goes to our local school systems. If we don't have that money coming in, there's nowhere else to get that money to go into our school systems but by increasing the taxes on real estate for every West Virginian. And nobody wants to do that. And so they haven't come up with a plan to backfill the revenue that will be lost if they get rid of that tax. Senator, do you feel the same way about that particular exactly. tax? Exactly. You know, uh, Delegate Miley is absolutely right. Uh, there was a bill proposed in last session uh, by the chair of the judiciary to raise the levy rates for education. Subsequently, they will be the ones that pay the citizens in those counties will make up the difference. And we're, I'm just afraid, you know, they may use that as the quid pro quo. The governor does propose um, several efforts, additional funding for child protective services. He wants to, to establish what he's calling a Medicaid Families First Reserve Fund. There are questions about that fund uh, today, Delegate Miley. What, what questions might you have about that fund? I'm not sure what the purpose of the fund is because I think if we're putting it in a, a lockbox, so to speak, is it there? There's $309 million, what they call surplus. Right. Uh, uh, unused, un unused, unused, unused funds. Medicaid money. Right. Which, which is a reflection of the 50,000 people that have dropped off the Medicaid rolls, which again is a reflection of people either dying or moving out of the state. But, but I, I, I'm okay with saving the money to be used in the future. Um, but I don't know that we shouldn't be using it, quite frankly, to expand Medicaid services such as dental work. Um, there's so many studies out there that, that connect poor dental hygiene to poor outcomes in life. What the, excuse me, what the governor is suggesting is to put it away at like a rainy day fund in case there, there's trouble with um, future programs that he can, he can dip into, into that. But you're saying that there that it could be used now and there are members of your caucus that are pointing out that it, there's a three to one match that 300 million could be worth almost a billion well, that, well that's right we, we have a very strong rainy day fund currently that you can tap into if you need to help meet, meet your budgetary needs but we also i mean are we such a healthy state that we can afford to take Medicaid dollars and put it away, or should we be spending it where we need to spend it, whether it's reimbursement rate increases, whether it's expanding the type of services that Medicaid will provide. That's what we need to be doing in West Virginia, in my opinion. But again, that means we would be taking care of West Virginians first, which is what I think we ought to be doing. When you put money away when these, there are these tremendous needs that still exist, we're not taking care of West Virginians first. And I would oppose that because I don't think it needs to be done. I think, I, I think the majority party has questions about that as well. We heard the, the vice chair raise some, some interest in using it toward economic development projects. He said that today, Senator Char. You know, one of, one of the problems you get into, it's $150 million. Mm -hmm. We were in finance this morning and Secretary Hardy, you know, had the number. He didn't have the legislation. He was, he was speculating 
and some of the questions he couldn't answer because he said, you know, the, the legislation was being developed. My concern is that, you know, now you're going to have a rainy day fund. The governor is going to have to make a decision on if there's a, uh, you know, a crisis in some Medicaid program. Come back to the legislature and do that. Now, we're in session two months out of the year. We're going to go into special session every time there's a crisis. You know, I think DHHR should manage that money. And, and, and if there is, when I was the chair of a finance, they never hesitated to come in and ask for more money for Medicaid. Now, the last couple of years, uh, you know, I was having a hard time following why we didn't need that money, Medicaid money now. But adding another level of bureaucracy just, just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we know that we ended December with 33 million in the red in terms of our um, state revenue projections. Uh, you've got the, the projections for this next six months. What are, are you confident in what is being predicted? It, it seems it, it's been mentioned. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Hardy, tax and revenue secretary, mentioned that. Severance taxes, coal severance taxes are at a 25-year low. Yeah, the lowest they've ever been. Metallurgical coal's at an all-time low. Gas is at an all-time low. We've got six months left in this fiscal year. Uh, they have, we've made a little bit of a gain about the first three months. You know, it looked like we were really in a decline. And then all of a sudden we, uh, you know, came back and uh, dropped the deficit from 40 million. Now it's 33. And we've got six months to go, so if this continues, I would say we're going to have about a $100 million deficit. That's not really crisis, but there will be a deficit. So building programs when you're in a deficit situation is, is, is suspect. So we're, you're going to have to, the next three months will, will tell us, you know, what's going to happen for this remainder of this fiscal year. And uh, we don't know. You're right. The severance tax line item is one of the three major line items that we watch closely, and that sort of dictates what's going to happen with the sales tax and the income tax. Delegate Miley, let's let's switch gears now and and talk about the the legislative agenda that you announced uh, with the senator this morning. Four basic areas. None of these, I mean, these are not unheard of efforts, that, uh, and, um, but, and, and you call them common sense efforts. L let's first begin with education. Your, your statement simply says fully fund public education, higher education, and PEIA. Well, let me say this. The way out of poverty, it's been, it's been proven time and time again, is through educating the people who are in poverty, or at least making it available to them. So we want to make sure we don't continue to cut higher education. We want to make sure our public education system is fully funded, including PEIA, which is so important to our public educators and, and school service personnel. But we, we want to propose some things, for example, the promise for all. And that we have some members who are very um, passionate about this. I'm one of them. But we want to make sure that we expand promise to make it available or some portion of it available to every student who wants to go to a higher education institution to get a four-year degree. We also want to pass a bill, if we can, that would give tax incentives to employers who help students out in repaying their student loan debt, because we know that's a problem. And these are things that we think will cause people to stay in the state or to come back to the state in which they were, they were raised and left um, and to get educated. And we think it, it, it will address several needs in our state. One, population decline being stopped and hopefully it turned around and reversed. It will help people elevate themselves from poverty. And quite frankly, we'll have an educated population out there. So those are some of the things we believe that education can do to empower people in our state that we want to push for. To me, it's common sense. To all of us, it's common sense. We'll see if it happens. You've talked about um, uh uh, small business incentives and, and, and tax cuts. I want to move on for the sake of time. Infrastructure. You want to focus, Senator, on not only secondary roads, but Sorry. broadband and clean water. Broadband is so important to our students. You know, if, if they can't go out and, and explore the world in, a, in an expedient manner, they're behind. I heard a statistic just the other day. Children that are born between age one and three, if parents or guardians or whoever has control of these children don't work with their children education-wise, 
by the time they're three years old and, and enter formal education programs, they're behind. So what do we do with these? We want to expand that early childhood, you know, the age three and things of that sort to, to help these children to, to get, you Mandated know, education yeah. or preschool education yeah, at, at least the, starting at the age opportunity three. to do it, you know, the, to give those children a chance because not all children are worked with, they're not read to, they're, you know, uh, they're not taught their colors, they're not you know, they, they just don't have that environment and, and they're behind when they get to the formal education. And we've got to do something to, to correct that. Um, but I'm sorry, what, about, uh, we, uh, we, no, the no, small businesses, yeah. you know, uh, this, the, yeah, the infrastructure, the sewerage, you know, everybody wants clean water. Uh, we're seeing now a movement by this, this leadership to take away all requirements for clean water and 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 and, and things of that sort, and, and we just think that's the wrong direction to go. If we're going to, we've got a beautiful state. Uh, if we're going to expand our tourism, it's imperative that we have clean water that people can come in from out of state, and you know, if they want to fish, they can do that and enjoy, you know, our, our rivers. We own all the rivers around us, so we've got to we've got to do the the, the utmost to, to ensure that we have clean water. Delegate Miley, I'll let you address policies that support our most vulnerable populations. You had a, a list um, that you were sharing today and will be proposing and supporting. Well, we want to um, institute a cap on co-pays for insulin, and that's been in the news lately with Delegate Flashower because so many of our population here is on insulin because they're diabetics. She, she manned the caravan, she was part of that, led the delegation to Canada recently. Well, that's right. So that's, that's one of the things we want to try to get past. Obviously, the governor is, is doing the, uh, take, removing the people off the IDD waiver list. That was on our agenda, so mm -hmm. that's already going to be taken care of, it looks like. Um, we want to protect um, those citizens with pre-existing conditions from their health insurance because we know that there's a challenge to it that's being pursued by Attorney General Morrissey in, in a federal lawsuit to invalidate the Obamacare uh, coverage, which includes pre-existing condition protections. Now he says he's got some bill to protect that. I think it's just an effort to kind of take the heat off of him for spearheading that lawsuit. But we want to make sure we institute and pass a bill that actually has real protections for those in the event the Obamacare um, uh, coverage gets invalidated by the court system. So those are some of the things we want to do to help the most needy and vulnerable in our society. All right, now I want to ask both of you, you both have said you will not be running for re-election this year. Uh, you were both, uh, uh, Delegate Miley, former Speaker of the House, Senator, former majority leader, chairs in respective and, and various uh, committees. Talk about your decision to leave. You both have said for family <clears throat> reasons, but also this atmosphere here. Um, last, sem last, I called it semester, thinking of my kids. <laughs> last session um, must have been a tipping point. Uh, do you want to, I'll go first. Um, I, I can't say last session was a tipping point. Um, when my term ends, it'll be 16 years. I never in a million years thought I would be down here that long. Um, but you have said this, this caustic political environment here, things aren't getting done. Well, I, I haven't used those words. Mm -hmm. Others have, mm -hmm. to be clear. My concern is this. I, I feel like there isn't an effort to get done what's best for our state and its citizens, but instead what's best for people on the outside who fund political campaigns. And that's what it's turned into with politics. There's tens of millions of dollars that come into campaigns, and those are IOUs, and you have to pay them back. And so we saw it last, last session mm -hmm. when we gave what amounts to uh, Bob Murray and Murray Energy a, a $60 million tax break. That's costing the state of West Virginia that money. But he was involved intimately in the success of the Republican majority getting elected, and in particular, that leadership team, and that's what he got in return. These big outside corporations aren't donating tens of millions of dollars into campaigns out of the generosity of their hearts. They expect a return on that money. It's an investment to them. In the past, if you disagreed on a policy and you and 
came to an agreement and you got both sides got half a loaf. That was probably pretty good policy. Um, nowadays, with the investments being made on both sides of tens of millions of dollars in the campaigns, they don't want half a loaf. They want the whole loaf because they made that investment. And so as a result, people just don't have an interest in doing the right thing anymore. Senator, I'm going to give you yeah, the last yeah, moment. I, know. I, I, I entirely can, uh, concur with uh, Delegate Molly. You know, the money has become a problem. But for me, the, I think the tipping point was I've, in my career over 30 years, I never, never really thought I'd ever be here this long. But I had a chance to work on policy and, and you know, I chaired major committees. I'm not given that opportunity now to sit down and work with my colleagues across the aisle and work on a legitimate policy that everybody can, you know, agree on. And, and that, I think that was a tipping point for me. All right. That'll have to be our last word. We will be following uh, the both of you, this agenda. We really appreciate your stopping by tonight. Sure. Thanks appreciate for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suzanne. Tomorrow on the legislature today, we start our Friday roundtable chats with State House journalists. We'll be joined by Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News, Phil Kabler of the Charleston Gazette Mail, and Emily Allen of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. I'm Suzanne Higgins. Thanks for joining us this evening. We'll see you tomorrow night.